Good morning, everyone. How are you? It's a great privilege to be able to finish this series, which I've enjoyed greatly. I've personally uh, gained a lot as we've opened up Psalm 119. Um, I want to start by showing you a, a picture. Um, have we got that photo there, the first one? How many of you followed this story over the last few weeks? Yeah, I think we all have. For me, I just felt like it just kept turning up in my newsfeed as the top story for days and days on end. And, uh, and I remember reading about it for the very first time. Um, part of my morning routine, I like to get up early. I'm fortunate enough to have a fairly quiet household in the early morning. So I get up, make a cup of coffee, and I like to spend a bit of time with the Lord and, and read His Word. Um, I was sharing with our 830 congregation, I, you know, I've been reading the Word for maybe 30 years, and I love it more now than ever before. I feel like I gain more from it now than I have before. And so that's a very precious time uh, for me every day to be able to do that. And uh, so once I've spent my, some time with the Lord, I do then just look over news headlines. And I remember seeing this story and thinking this is a little bit different because normally with a news story, it's bad news, isn't it? Like it's kind of, it's hopeless. It's that, that, that uh, a group of people might have gone into a cave and didn't make it out alive. That's normally when it becomes news. But this was a little bit different. And, uh, and I remember something in me just, uh, I don't know that I dwelt on it for very long, but something in me just shot up a prayer. Lord, I pray that they, they all come out safe. And I'm sure we all did as we heard that story. So there they were, these 12 boys and their coach. They go exploring in these caves, and uh, only they can't get out again because while they're in there, some of the caves are filled up with water. And, uh, and so there they are. They're in the dark. They're without hope. And it was at this press conference that one of the boys uh, spoke about the moment that they realized they had been found. And I don't know if uh, um, some of you probably uh, heard them share this. What they said was, they saw a torch, a little light coming up out of the water. And at that moment, they said we were filled with joy because we knew that we were saved. Now, we also know the story wasn't over at that point. I, I kind of assumed, okay, well, that's great. They've been found two hours. They'll be, they'll be out of there. Uh, but it wasn't that simple, as we know. And so it would be another 10 days before they were all led safely out of that uh, cave. I'll come back and share about that a little bit more later on. Um, now, I don't know how many of you here have been lost in a cave. Um, it's probably not an experience that many of us have, have been through. How many of you have been in pitch blackness, like isolated? Yeah, it's pretty scary, isn't it? When no sound, no sight... It's a, a pretty scary thing. And yet, you know what? In our spiritual lives, we have all been through that. We were all lost in darkness and without hope until Jesus came to us and we discovered what the Word said about us. So we've been doing this series called Anchored. And I've just really enjoyed digging into Psalm 119. We talked about the Word as being like a delight to our hearts. Pastor Tim shared that in the first week. Um, Cass shared about it, the Word being like a mirror to our face. Um, Pastor Bill shared a message on, on it, the Word being a truth to stake our lives on. Great message. And then last week, Pastor Adrian Cottrell sharing about food for our soul. And today we're talking about the Word being like a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. How God leads and guides us through the darkness of life with his word. Amen? And so why don't we just read through this passage. If you've got a Bible or Bible app there, you might like to turn to uh, Psalm 119. Uh, we'll have it on the screen as well here from verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I've taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I've suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth 
and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart, and my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. What a beautiful description of God's Word. And I want to open this up a little bit this morning using, um, using a different translation, using the Message Paraphrase Bible, because I think it just brings out a couple of really interesting things and words it um, uh, in a different way. And so we're going to talk about how we can remember and obey His Word, but also how God can renew us and teach us with the Word. So the first thing I want to share from you this passage this morning is that it is by His words that we can see where we're going. I am convinced that it's by His words that we can see through the darkness of life. That has been my experience and I know experience of many of you here who have walked with Jesus for, for many years. I might not know all the answers all the time, uh, and I can only see as far as the light will let me, but that's all I need to know when my life is in God's hands and when He is in control. Um, let's have a look at how the message uh, words that first verse, 105 says, by your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Now, I'm very conscious that uh, we read the Bible nowadays in our 21st century Context, which makes sense because we're living in the 21st century, and so it's only natural. But it's good to remember that some of these passages were written. Uh, I mean, this one was written maybe a thousand years before Jesus' time, th maybe three thousand years ago. It's experienced by different people at different times, and and we experience the word differently. So it's good to remember that. I mean, one thing for us is that we read a passage like this. And perhaps we, we straight away think of Jesus because Jesus is described as being the Word come to life. And Jesus is also described as being a light that came into the world. And so we can read that and, and note that it foreshadows the coming of Jesus. But we've got to remember uh, that it wasn't written in that context. So Jesus is described as, as the Word in, in John chapter 1, also described as light in John 8, 12. And so it's, it's important because it immediately makes us think of the gospel message, that Jesus came he, to earth, light of the world. He was born, a little baby, humble circumstances, lived a, an ordinary life, he died a death on a cross for each and every one of us. And then he rose to life also that we could have relationship with God, that our sins could be forgiven. That is the power of what Jesus did for us. And so I, straight away when I read something like that, that, that the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to my path, it makes me think of Jesus. But we got to remember that when the psalmist wrote that, they weren't necessarily thinking of that context. Um, and, and so historical context is, uh, is everything. I was thinking of an example, actually. Um, a few years ago, Pastor Adrian Cotter and I went to a Bible exhibition. I got this random invitation in the mail. I, don't know, I still don't know who sent it to me, to go to a Bible exhibition. And Adrian was doing his Bachelor of Theology at the time, and I said, well, Adrian, why don't you look up with this Bible exhibition? It was to celebrate, I think, the 500 years of the King James Bible. Does that sound right? 500 or 400, Pastor Phil? 500. And uh, so I thought, well, why not? Anyway, so Adrian and I, uh, you know, we were kind of young guys in our 20s, early 30s at that point. So I was just, I think, just wearing jeans and T-shirt. Adrian was in, like, thongs and, and shorts. 
So we rock up to this Bible exhibition ahead of the Governor General because, yeah, apparently it was like a formal thing and it didn't really say that on the invitation. And we thought, okay, we'll, we know how to handle this. We'll just sit in the back row. Nobody will notice us. Well, of course, when we got in there, all the seats are full, aren't they? And an usher sees us and says, oh, yes, this is true, right down the front. We'll sit you right there. So we just wanted to die. We were like, ugh. But it was a pretty amazing experience. There was a lecture and they, they talked about it. And then we went and looked at some of the Bibles on display. And it was pretty incredible. One of them was an amazingly humbling experience. It was William Shakespeare's Bible, which had passages underlined and places where he'd noted the things he could use in his plays. It was pretty extraordinary. A, a historical artifact to look at. And even just to look at the way that maybe the word had, had been speaking to him. But there was one that really stood out to me. And that was a family, sort of lower to middle class family, 500 years ago. The Bible was the only book they owned. It was the only paper they had in their household. So the word takes on a whole different meaning when it's the only book you own. I mean, they really lived it. They read it every day. They underlined, they scribbled in there. There was not any clear uh, spaces on the page because if there was room, they wrote on it. And it was more that they wrote down the revelations of the Word and the things that the Word was saying to them. But they also wrote down all the births, deaths and marriages in the family, recipes. I mean, they wrote down everything. This was a record of their history. The Word takes on a whole new meaning when you think of it. In a, in a different historical context like that. You think about some of the imagery in this, um, in this passage. It's talking about a lamp. Now, again, when we hear lamp, we think our 21st century torch uh, or maybe, you know, a lantern like that. But in actual fact, uh, an Old Testament lamp would have looked a little bit like this. So we got the picture there. So you can see the wick uh, coming out at the end there. And it's an unusual sort of shell shape. And I would imagine that to use this lamp, you had to hold it like this. Out in front of you. That's a really interesting posture when we think about the lamp, or when the word being like a lamp. Held as something precious. And, or, or maybe, how many of you read Oliver Twist? When you were at school or you've heard the story, what was the posture? Please, sir, can I have some more? Now, when you think about your Bible reading, that's an interesting little uh, posture to consider. So it's helpful to visualize this image because when we read something like, lamp to my feet, we think pointing the torch out in front of us. But in, in actual fact, it looked more like this. Now, in practical terms... We can sometimes expect God's Word to speak to us immediately, right? It's a living Word. And so when we, we need guidance or direction on something, we, we would just love to be able to open up the pages of the Bible and look up at any passage. Oh, okay, and God can speak through it. Now, God can certainly do that, but more often than not, He doesn't. Um, I mean, I've had a couple of instances where I felt God do that. I remember one, we were in our life journal readings, we were uh, starting a new book, I can't remember what Old Testament book it was, but there was a whole chapter of genealogies, you know, it's just name after name, so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and, -so, and, -so, and just went on and on and on, and I was kind of like, oh Lord, I just need something a bit more inspiring than a list of names this morning, you know what I mean? I know you can speak through this passage, but, so what I did was I cheated, I said, I'll just sneak a look at a psalm as well, and uh, that'll kind of top me up. So I randomly picked Psalm 100. Um, there was no particular reason, other than that was about where I was up to in Psalms the last time I'd been reading it, and I thought, okay, we'll go from Psalm 100. And so it starts off, praise be to God, yada, 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 yada. That's just my quick translation, right? I come down to verse 5, and it says, you have been faithful throughout the generations, it stopped me dead in my tracks. 
because God said, see, there is a purpose to that genealogy, to that list of names. Every single one of those names represents a life lived. There was a reason for them being there. God saw fit to record those names in his book. And, uh, and so God does speak through his word supernaturally. But like Pastor Adrian suggested last week, it's a process. It's almost like a relationship with the Word. We have to grow in our knowledge and understanding of it. And so it's easy for me, somebody who's been reading it for many years, just to think that uh, uh, um, information about the Word somehow is just automatically downloaded from when I got saved. That's not the case, of course. I had to learn about the history of it and the structure of it and the different styles of writing. And all of that kind of stuff helps us to make sense uh, of the Word. And so it takes time to get to know the Word. I'll give you another example, actually. Uh, earlier this year, I was contemplating making a, a, a change in my life uh, around an area, and so, uh, but I hadn't felt the peace of God on it. And so I prayed in a way that you probably shouldn't pray. I said, well, God, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to move in this direction. If you don't want me to, you know, you need to speak loud and clear. Uh, I don't recommend it. Um, and so, so I started to read the, the word for that day, which was, I think, Acts chapter 1. And, uh, and again, a, a few verses in, and I got to verse 4, and I see this, Do not leave Jerusalem. Now, I, I'm very well aware that I was taking this out of context, right? That passage is all about Jesus talking to his disciples before he's ascended into heaven. But it was like seven or eight verses, all one after the other, all little things that I felt God pointing out about my circumstance and my situation. I was like, okay, now I have felt God speaking loud and clear. I'm convinced that God speaks through his word and that I can see through the darkness when I'm feeling like a lack of direction or a struggle God does speak through his word and that's a word for some of you here today you want to know all the details up front but we God wants us to trust him and trust in his light so how can we uh, how can God's word be a light to us well firstly there is what we can do with God's word and that is to remember it and obey it. That is something that we can practically do. Have a look at this uh, from our psalm uh, in the message version, verse 109. My life is as close as my hands. Think of the posture again. But I don't forget what you have revealed. I don't forget, I remember it. The wicked do their best to throw me off track, but I don't swerve an inch from your course. Those two things that we can do. Don't forget, don't swerve from the course. We're going to do everything we can to remember the Word because it's easy, even if we set a regular time every day, other things get in the way. It's easy to, for distractions of life to come in or, or sometimes we get stuck in a routine and it's just, okay, yeah, well, I'm reading the Word but I'm not necessarily gleaning something for it. And we've got to push beyond those obstacles and barriers. And there are so many great ways that you can do that. For example, if you're traveling to work or school or whatever, you know, you've got half an hour in a car or on a bus or something, get a podcast, get an audio Bible, do, do something that so you don't have to, if you're not a fan of reading uh, lots of material, get audio Bibles. Fantastic way to get the word into you. Or listen to sermons. You can grab some of our old ones from YouTube or... Um, there are some good, reputable churches with preachers of similar values. Listen to their sermons. I love talking with Sam and Tanya because you guys quite often listen to sermons and we talk about, oh, I heard this message from Stephen Furtick or whoever. It's fantastic. It's a great way of getting the Word because you don't just get the Word, but you get interpretation as well when you listen to sermons. So there's lots we can do just to get the Word on the inside of us. But we need a little bit more than that. When you're faced with the challenges of life, you've got to do everything you can to obey the Word because that's where it starts to make a difference, whether the Word has uh, transformed our lives. There's plenty of people who can quote the Word at you. There's head knowledge. 
But when faced with the challenges of life, don't necessarily heed the wisdom of the word. They haven't really got, the, got it on the inside. And so it's very easy when challenges come our way, we start to make excuses. Uh, well, I'll just watch a few minutes of this, even though I know I shouldn't. I'll just spend money on this, even though I know I probably shouldn't. I'll just hang out with this person for a bit, even though I know they're no good for me. The word has to penetrate our heart. Just like light has to penetrate through darkness. Jesus said in John 3, 19, lights come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. It's not easy. Something in us wants to resist sometimes. And so we've got to push through. Remember it and obey it. We've got to let the light of God's word shape our character so that when we are tested, our response is aligned to the Father's heart. Amen? And so that's what we can do. But there's more that the Word can do beyond what we can do in our own strength with it. We can remember and obey it, but there is what God can do with His Word. So now let me illustrate this. Pastor Phil, can you maybe give me a hand for a second? You're going to role play the part of God, is that all right? You're up for it? Good man. Okay. Word of God in my life. I mean, God wrote his word. He, he spoke it through human beings, just like you and me, imperfect people. But they heard the infallible word of God and, and wrote it down as a record for, for us to follow. So the word in my hand... I can be reading it, I can be remembering it, I can be obeying it. God, where are you? I'm using this word as a light, where are you, where are you? If I'm in the, facing the wrong direction, I'm not going to find God in there, am I? It's only when I put my life, can you hold your hands up in that cup shape? It's only when I put my life back in God's hands that he can activate the word in me. And so... With the light in front of me, I can always see where I'm going. Can you walk backwards? The light source is always there in front of me, having been walking up an aisle. <laughs> Look out, you're about to crack. No, you're not. See, with the light always before us, with our life in God's hands, we're always on track. Thank you, you can sit down. And so what happens is, because we have... His word illuminated to us by that revelation of grace. So what Jesus did for us, his death, his resurrection, his forgiveness for us, plus that supernatural understanding that the Spirit brings, that's when we can read this and God can renew us through it and he can teach us from it. Let's head back to our psalm again and look at this verse 107. Everything's falling apart on me. How many of you have ever felt like that? We, we all have at some point, haven't we? Everything's falling apart on me. It might be relationships. It might be in our finances. It might be work. It might be study. Whatever it is. We can feel like that. But have a look at this prayer. God, put me together again with your word. Festoon me with your finest sayings. How many of you like a good festooning? <laughs> I have to make a little confession. I glossed over this at the 8.30 service, and I saw people going for their phone. What on earth is festoon? <laughs> <laughs> festoon uh, means to adorn or, or decorate. Very similar to the word festival, so it's about a celebration, covering Festoon me with your finer sayings. God, teach me your holy rules. As a pastor, um, I hear lots of people's life stories. And, and quite often I hear um, many people sharing circumstances uh, of their life where they say, I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel like I'm broken. I'm at the end of my tether. And it's very important for me as a pastor 
to recognize that there's nothing I can really do in my own strength. I have to lead people to the word. I can make practical suggestions of what people can do, but it's not me that puts people back together again. It's God through his word. Only the word can renew when we get to that point. And it's when we're at our most broken, that's when God can put us together again by his word. I remember several years ago, I'd been through a very difficult time. I was just coming out of it, and it was at one of our pastor's conferences with a guest speaker we had called Gordon Moore. And, uh, and he gave a, a ministry challenge to pray for people who wanted renewing and, and re-strengthening. And I was up in the corporate box up the top there, doing the media, and so I couldn't get down the front for the ministry time. And so as soon as the service ended, I made a beeline for Gordon. I came down. I said, oh, I really felt that that resonated with me. And so I asked him to pray with me. And he said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And I'm just going to demonstrate what he did. He put his hand on my chest like that. And he started praying. He said, Lord, I pray the word of God would return to Nathan's heart. And in that moment, something in me leapt. Because it wasn't, it wasn't just a love for God's word, it was the living word as well. It was what God had spoken over my life, a passion to want to continue to follow in him. And from that moment on, uh, I've really felt something stirred up in me uh, in the spirit. Maybe some of you are at that point today where you're feeling like, I need renewing, I need strengthening, I need the spirit stirred up in my life. Have a look at this little uh, picture. Is that the next picture there? You might not be able to see it very clearly. How many of you have heard of this before? Kintsukuroi. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I apologize if I pronounced it properly. This is a Japanese art form, which uh, is the art of restoring broken pottery with gold. You can only just see it. So little seams of gold around there. And it's the concept that this is now worth much more for having been broken in the first place and restored with that gold. That is what our lives are like with the Word. This is gold that puts our lives back together. When we have the Word inside us, it starts to restore and repair. God puts us together again by His Word. Have a look at this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And going from verse 4 there, yep. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. That is a sad reality for many people. They're blinded, they're in darkness. They don't see the glory of God. Verse 5, for what we preach is not ourselves, it's not of our own strength, our own doing, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That's Christ in us. So now we have the benefit of reading God's Word, but we also have the living Christ, the living Word in our lives. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, a bit like our little clay pot, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. How many of you feel hard-pressed? I'm conscious some of you are in situations where you feel pressured, maybe even right now, today. We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. That is God's promise. We're not crushed. Perplexed. Sometimes you might be feeling confused, perplexed, troubled, but don't despair. We have a great hope. We might feel persecuted, but we are not abandoned in that. God is with us always. When, when we remember His Word and it's active in our life, we have His Word always available to us. And maybe we feel struck down. But God says, you are not destroyed. And he lifts us up and he leads us out. I'm conscious that some of you here, maybe today, you feel like some of those things. What I love about that passage is that it acknowledges that, hey, you know what? We go through seasons in life where we feel like that. We go through seasons in life where we feel maybe trapped in darkness. But Jesus is our great hope. He's the one who brings us out. Hallelujah. 
as I bring this to a close this morning, the last thing I want to share from this passage is that his light is our inheritance. It's not just about leading us out of situations. We don't just turn to God in those trouble moments when we need him. Sometimes we kind of treat our relationship with God like that. When the pressure comes on, when the tough times comes on, suddenly the faith levels go whoop, like that. Have you noticed that? But this is a forever word. We never graduate from it, but we just grow in our love and our knowledge of it. You know, I've heard people say, not in this church, fortunately, but I have heard people say, yeah, I've read the Bible a few times too. I pretty much have grasped it now. I don't think there's probably any more that I can glean from it. What? Are you kidding me? You've got a lot more to learn from it. I feel like I have learned more in the last few months of reading the Bible than I have the previous 30 years of reading it. And I trust and believe that will continue to be the case until I go home to be with Jesus that I will love his word more and more. And that is my prayer for each and every one of you. Have a look at this last verse from Psalm 119. The last part of the section says, I inherited your book on living. It's mine forever. What a gift and how happy it makes me. I concentrate on doing exactly what you say. I always have and I always will. That is the commitment that we can make to God and to being people of his word and to walk in his example. That's been my experience. And the good news is that we then carry that light with us to be a light to others. Jesus described himself as the light of the world. He said, I'm the light of the world when he came to earth. But he also said to his disciples, Matthew 5, he says, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. When you've got Jesus in you, you can't hide it. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. If you're followers of Jesus, we want to share his love with other people. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. God wants you to let your light shine so that people see Jesus in you as well. Praise God. Why don't we stand together? I want to invite you to bow your heads. We're going to have a time of just responding to Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Eyes closed. This is between a time between you and the Lord to respond. Let me lead you in a prayer. Father God, we reach out to you today. We thank you because your word is a now word. That it does lead us through even the darkest of circumstances. We thank you because it's a powerful word. It's a word that heals. It's a word that strengthens. And so, Lord, we want to be known as people of the word. God, stir in us today a passion, a great passion for you and your word. Speak to us powerfully, Lord, we pray. We open our hearts to you in this place this morning. We're open, Lord, to everything you have to say. As we're in this moment of prayer and heads bowed, eyes closed, just conscious that this is a very personal moment for, for some people here. If God has been speaking to you today through this passage of Scripture, through these words, maybe for the first time, you've never invited Jesus into your heart. As we've talked about being lost in darkness Maybe that's resonated with you and you recognize you need Jesus. You need a Savior. You can receive Him today. If that's you, while no one's looking around, if you want to invite Jesus into your heart, if you recognize your need for a Savior, I want to encourage you, just raise your hand just so I know that 
you would like to be prayed for this morning. Is there anyone here? That feeling of being lost in darkness. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, see that here. Just pray these words in your heart as I lead you through them. Dear Jesus, I recognize my need for you. I've been in darkness and I need your light. I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. Come into my heart this day, Lord. I receive your love. I want to walk with you from this day forward and forevermore. Have your way in my life, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time, I know a couple of you did. That is the most powerful, most important, most wonderful decision you can ever make. I invited Jesus into my heart as an eight, nine-year-old. I have never looked back. Jesus has never done me any wrong. I've only felt strengthened and renewed. Doesn't mean life is easy all the time, but He is with me always. We would love to connect with you. Uh, Either you can talk with one of our pastors or let us know on a connect card that you prayed that prayer. Others of you today, if if as I've been sharing, you felt stirred about uh, being renewed in the Word. Maybe you're going through suffering at the moment. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's emotions. Maybe it's in your relationships. We have time in this place. Tanya's going to lead us uh, in a song. And I want to invite you to come forward for prayer this morning. And let's believe and trust Jesus together. Amen? Whatever you're facing, it's not too difficult for God to work through. So I want to invite you to come forward now. And we're going to stand with you. One of our prayer ministry team will just come and pray with you. You don't have to share all the details. But let's bring our hearts before God this morning. Amen.